Howdy folks, uh, this of course is the first Q&A of 2024, Q&A for January in the Salt Mines Discord server and also going out as Monday's episode of Mingles with Jingles. So thank you to everybody who turned up uh, in person in order to post your questions and if you're watching this as an episode of Mingles with Jingles, hope you all had a great weekend <laughs> but forget it because it's over <laughs> and uh, Monday is here but hopefully we have an episode of Mingles with Jingles uh, to brighten up the day for you. Before we crack on however, we're going to have a quick word from our sponsors. Breakfast. The most important meal of the day, or so they say. And I do love me a good full cooked English breakfast. Bacon, sausage, baked beans, fried eggs, scrambled eggs. But while they're telling you that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, they go suspiciously quiet when you ask them to get out of bed and cook it for you. <laughs> so cereal, in this case Magic Spoon, the breakfast of champions, for those of us, you know who you are, who can't be bothered to get out of bed first thing in the morning and cook yourself a big, unhealthy breakfast. Magic Spoon, on the other hand, honestly, I have no idea what they make this stuff out of. But it's high protein, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, wheat-free, and peanut butter flavor, easily my favorite. The variety pack comes in four flavors, cocoa, peanut butter, frosted, and fruity. And you can get yourself $5 off your first order by going to magicspoon.com slash Monty Jingles, scanning the QR code appearing on screen, or just click on the link in the video description and get $5 off your first variety pack just like this. Honestly, the peanut butter, it even smells great. Mm. And um, get yourself your Magic Spoon variety pack just like this. It's not for kitties though, is it? Because she ruined the first two takes of this, by the way. <laughs> Climbing up, sticking her nose in my bowl. She really likes the peanut butter flavour as well, don't you, little girl? Yeah, suspiciously quiet now. Anyway, you know what? This is really, and you don't even have to have it for breakfast. What? Magic spoon. You click the link and get yours today. And so, uh, with that out of the way, without any further ado, let's crack on with the questions. So, popping over to the questions channel in Discord. First question from Helix Folks, also known as Love Muffin. Will you be playing Fallout London when it comes out in April? Yes, definitely. As I'm sure most of you are aware, I am a fairly big Fallout fan. I loved Fallout 3, I loved Fallout 4 especially. Despite its limitations, I do like Fallout 5, also known as Starfield. Um, and, and yeah, but the thing about Fallout London, I don't know if you've been following the development of it, this is a mod, right? It's not like official DLC or anything, but it's a mod for Fallout 4 that's bigger than Fallout 4. <laughs> it's been in development for a couple of years, and I have been watching videos on its, uh, on its progress, and it is looking really, really good. Um, somebody was saying earlier that it's not just bigger than all of Fallout and the Far Harbor DLC combined. It's basically the map is the size of the county of Devon and that's not small so yeah definitely looking forward to Fallout 4 when it comes out apparently in April um, I believe it's it's it's, it's going to be free um, it is a mod after all and it's absolutely huge the amount of detail that they've stuffed into it it's kind of like when you're playing The Division and you're wandering around Manhattan and you're thinking, oh I remember that and I recognize that they've done that to London basically and put it in Fallout and while I'm not a Londoner, I have been to London a couple of times and I've recognised, I mean, you know, you're going to recognise the obvious stuff like the Palace of Westminster and Tower Bridge and so on and so on. But there's other little places, like Brick Lane, for example, the famous um, home of London Curry. They're all there in the game. Um, I'm very much looking forward to it. And uh, if you have any interest in Fallout, you probably should too, because it's probably going to be the best Fallout game. Um, well... <laughs> Probably, well, I don't know, maybe. I mean, Bethesda's track record hasn't been great over the last couple of years, so this is likely to be the best Fallout game you will have ever played. So if you're a fan of Fallout, get Fallout London marked up on your calendar. It's coming out in April. Next question comes from Yamatog2. Uh, Almighty Overlord Jingles, firstly, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Secondly, do you still smoke? Mm, yes, yes, I do. If you do, have you considered quitting smoking? And if not, what made you quit? Um, I started smoking 
when I was 14 years old. It's 1984, I was at boarding school in South Africa. We, we lived in Swaziland, but Swaziland's got some great primary schools, but aside from the one public school that they have, uh, which is ridiculously expensive and very, very good, their high schools tended to be kind of crap. So a lot of the immigrants would send their kids to boarding school in South Africa. And um, what can I say? Smoking was cool. And so I started smoking at the, when I was very young and stupid at the age of 14, and I've been smoking ever since. Um, I did quit once, although it wasn't through choice. Um, in the Navy, when I first joined the Navy, you were allowed to smoke in mess decks and at your place of work and so on and so on, because that's just what it was like in the, in the 80s. Um, people really didn't give a shit about non-smokers. <laughs> well, the compasses swung the other way. Um, so I used to be able to smoke in the communications office where I was working as a radio operator. I could smoke in the mess deck. It must have been absolutely bloody awful for all of the non-smokers. But shortly after I joined the Navy, they started clamping down on it. So no longer, basically you weren't allowed to smoke um, in the ship. You could smoke on the upper deck. Um, and that basically meant you would go to the quarter deck, the bit at the back of the ship underneath the flight deck. Fresh air, you can watch the dolphins playing in the ship's wake and have a smoke and take a sneaky 10 minutes off work every couple of hours or so. Uh, but in bad weather, the, um, it's too much risk of you being swept overboard. So the quarter deck would be closed and all the smokers would have to smoke in the, uh, in the aft airlock leading out onto the quarter deck. Now the aft airlock is not a big room and there were a lot of smokers on board so it could get quite nasty. Um, but the, the one occasion where it was just so bad that I couldn't face smoking anymore was just, it would have been about this time of year. Um, NATO had this big exercise up off uh, the north coast of Scotland in an area of the North Sea uh, known as Cape Wrath. And it's not called Cape Wrath because the weather's nice. <laughs> it was horrible January winter storms. Um, nobody was allowed out on the upper deck. It was just too dangerous. The ship was rolling and pitching around for weeks. This, this, this lasted for like a two week exercise and it was just absolutely horrible. Now I don't normally get seasick. I've always been quite lucky. Uh, the first ship that I was on, HMS Brazen, the communications, communications yeoman on there, um, who, to give you an idea of how long he had been in the Navy, when he was a boy sailor, he served on HMS Blake, which was the sister ship to HMS Tiger, which is in World of Warships, right? That's how old <laughs> this ship was. Um, and he could get seasick standing in a puddle. And he'd been in the Navy like 20 years. Uh, but I was never, I was always, you know, reasonably good. I had a good pair of sea legs. I, I very, very rarely got seasick. And I, put, let's just put it this way, going for a smoke in that aft airlock. Right, and you'd have 20 smokers crammed in shoulder to shoulder in a room that would have struggled to fit eight people all smoking just, I, don't, I don't know if you can understand just how disgusting this place was the the nicotine was condensing on the deck head above us on the ceiling and dripping <laughs> down onto onto all of us oh it was horrible and i was like no that's it oh i'm, I'm stopping I'm, i can't do this anymore the thing was my mess deck 2q port mess deck was basically in the flat right forward of the aft airlock and you could sm after a couple of days of smoking you actually get things back like oh, after a couple of days of not smoking you get things back like your sense of smell it, it's amazing how bad your sense of smell and taste is if you smoke and so after a couple of days of not smoking i started to get my sense of smell and taste back and i could smell what that airlock actually smelled like I, I i got an idea of what non-smokers were having to put up with <laughs> with that airlock and oh it was just i was getting just sick from the smell of what was happening in that airlock um and so for two weeks i basically stopped smoking and i felt fine i felt great and then the exercise concluded we got back to portsmouth i got off the ship and the first thing i did was buy a pack of cigarettes because i'm because <laughs> i'm addicted um so I haven't ever really considered quitting, um, but the one time that I did actually quit, that was what caused it. And it only lasted two weeks and then I went straight back to it. Next question from Aki Aki Kiakaha. 
Are you going to play the New Horizon Zero Dawn game when it finally comes out on PC? That, that would be Forbidden West. Yeah, I was a big fan of the original Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, and they did an expansion for it as well. Frozen North, I can't remember what it was. But yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed the game. The, the gameplay was, I mean, it was basically... It was basically a Ubisoft open world game, even though it wasn't Ubisoft. Uh, but done well. And um, with that thing that they usually tend to forget to put into Ubisoft open world games, a really, really good story. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I am very much looking forward to the sequel when it does finally, eventually, maybe one day come out on PC. So that's that's definitely on my wish list. Next question from Tac Fifty US. Dear Fleet Admiral Jingles. Oh no no. Oh, thank you for the promotion. But I, I am I am a confirmed rear admiral. During your time in the navy, was there ever a time when you came close to biting the big one? Oh, I was actually. Yeah. Uh, he says one such case happened when he was a volunteer firefighter. And the roof, he and his crew were on start of feeling spongy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the officer in charge told everyone to get off the roof. Yeah, nobody had to be told twice. Yeah. No one was hurt, except that their K-12 saw that some someone survived being engulfed in flames, but it turned out a long and cold January night near Philly 2005. Yeah, um, the one occasion where it, it could have, it could have, it got quite, quite nasty and could have gone either way. Uh, was during the first Gulf War. So this was my first deployment. I'd, I'd been out of training three months. I actually flew out to join the ship, HMS Brazen, Type 21, 22? No, Type 22 for a wow. No, don't get old kids, your memory's the first thing that goes. Type 22 frigate. Um, big ships, by the way, Type 22 frigates. People think of frigates as being like little small things, smaller than destroyers, but in the Royal Navy, um, I think in the US Navy they classify their ships broadly by the size of the ship. So the cruisers are the big ones, then the destroyers, then the frigates, and so on and so on. But in the Royal Navy they classify them by their role. So a frigate's a general purpose ship, a destroyer's an air defense ship, and so on and so on. And Type 22s were big. I mean, they're bigger than a lot of World War II cruisers. Um, but I flew out to join the ship, first Gulf War. I was on board for about two months, and then the war kicked off. And when the war kicked off, there were. The British task force out there, there was a, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Argus, which was a hospital ship. Um, was it the Argus? I can't remember. Let's say the Argus for the sake of argument. Uh, there were two Type 42 destroyers, HMS Southampton and HMS Nottingham, and there were two Type 22 frigates, uh, us, HMS Brazen and HMS London. And the uh, task force Commodore, can't remember his name, he was uh, using the London as his flagship. So, uh, the two destroyers were right at the northern end of the Gulf doing, um, you know, combat operations and escorting the American carrier task force. Uh, London was escorting the hospital ship and Brazen, we, we, we called ourselves the Combat Fruit and Veg Patrol because we were escorting merchantmen through the Straits of Hormuz down at the southern end of the Gulf just in case Iran tried to, you know, throw its towel in as well. Um, and then there was this one occasion where... The task force Commodore decided that he was going to take the London up further north just to, you know, see what was going on. And they needed us to come up and take over escort for the hospital ship. So we did. And that was the day that the Iraqi Air Force decided they were going to stop hiding and come out and play. <laughs> and there were a couple of Iraqi MiGs. Uh, decided they were going to go and have a go with their uh, missiles at the hospital ship, which we were escorting. Now, at the time, uh, the Type 22 frigates were equipped with the Seawolf uh, short-range missile defense system, and it's a very, very good system. I've seen a Seawolf in tests uh, take out 4.5-inch artillery shell, right? They're that accurate. The problem is they're very short-range, something like 4.5 kilometers. Um, and a Type 22 frigate has two launchers, one at the front, one at the rear. Six missiles each, so 12 shots, and then they have to be manually reloaded. Uh, but if you need more than 12, you're probably going to die anyway. So the, the problem with our Seawolf was that it was what was called OPDEF, an operational deficiency, an OPDEF. And the, it had no infrared tracking, it was busted. Uh, the other problem with our Seawolf is that for reasons only known to the ship's command, they decided that the Seawolf activation key would be kept around the weapon engineering officer's waist at all times. Now, when you go to action stations, you kind of need your weapons and sensors ready to go at a second's notice. Not, 
somebody wake up the Wii-O and get him up there and turn on the Seawolf. So, uh, where they're escorting HMS London, uh, no, sorry, we've taken over from HMS London, we're escorting this hospital ship, and a pair of Iraqi MiGs decided that they were going to take their chances and try to blow this uh, hospital ship out of the water, because, you know, what's a war crime amongst friends? So, um, and we were escorting them, and uh, we couldn't really rely on a missile defence system, so our only other option really was to put ourselves between the attack and the hospital ship and take the hit for them. Now, we weren't completely without defences, we did have passive defences. There was uh, this thing called, um, I can't even remember what it's called, but basically it's a sort of a radar decoy. Uh, you pop off the side of the ship and then put as much distance between it and yourself as possible. I think it's called DLF. Can't remember what it stands for. We had that, but we couldn't rely on Seawolf. Uh, I was completely, I knew we were at action stations because we were under attack, but I didn't, I didn't know what, you know, what the situation was until, as a radio operator, I had a flash message come in, uh, which had to be rushed to the principal warfare officer in the operations room. So I ripped this signal off the teleprinter, ran into the ops room, and I, tr I tried to get this signal to the warfare officer, and then the, uh, the ops room supervisor basically body-checked me at the door <laughs> and said, fuck off, <laughs> we're busy. Um, and so I just stood there at the ops room door, waiting. It, because, you, you know, that's my job. Flash signal comes in, you have to take it instantly to the person that needs to see it. Understandably, they were kind of busy at the time because there were these two bigs coming in, but managed to get, and I had a grandstand view of exactly what was going on in the ops room at the time and realised, oh, we're actually in the shit here, aren't we? As these two MiGs got to within two minutes of missile launch range and then a pair of Saudi Arabian F-15 Eagles, uh, one of them took one of them down blew him out of the sky, the other one dumped his weapons and ran for home. Uh, that was it, two minutes away from probably dying. So that was fun. Thank you for the question. Next question from Yalara. Uh, Happy New Year, oh mighty lord of the salt mines. Have you ever watched the TV series Hornblower and Shark featuring Ian Grufford and Sean Bean? Which one did you enjoy the most and why? I have. Um, I didn't really get to see Sharp that much because I was... I think it was probably in, I mean, I was abs it was either away in, I can't remember exactly when it came out, but I was either living in South Africa, in which case we didn't get it, or in the Navy, in which case we didn't get a lot of TV uh, at sea, uh, mostly relied on like big videotapes and then later DVDs and then even later media, uh, media stations. So I didn't see that many episodes of Shop, but because we were in the Navy, everybody loved Hornblower. So I did actually watch quite a few episodes of that. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, obvious, obvious answer, Hornblower, because Navy. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, although Sharp was very, very good, uh, but it wasn't really my thing, Hornblower was. Next question comes from Gosswalk. Greetings to the salt mine overlord from the freezing conditions of the Northern salt mine operation. If I may be so bold and ask a little bit of heating, it's been minus 25 degrees for the better part of two weeks. Well, you could always burn your tools, but then of course you'd have to pay for replacements. So, yeah, it's up to you. And now to my question. What's your favourite game that you have ever played or you have the most nostalgia for? Ooh. Oh, and he also said, are you recording? Because if it's funny once, it's funny every time. <laughs> favourite game? I would probably have to say the original Secret of Monkey Island. Uh, from what were, at the time, Lucasfilm games. They're now... Fat. They changed the name of LucasArts. I don't even know if they're still around. I think they might have been liquidated, because I certainly haven't seen a game from Lucas LucasArts in years. But The Secret of Monkey Island was um, a point-and-click graphic adventure. I don't think they really do that kind of game anymore. I suppose the closest thing to it these days would be the Telltale, the Telltale games, like Tales from the Borderlands and The Walking Dead. Um, but those are all... It's a different presentation style, uh, but they just didn't have the tech back then to do full 3D. Um, but the, the thing about The Secret of Monkey Island was it was the first, well, technically not the first time because they did a game prior to that called Loom, where you couldn't actually die, um, which was a novel idea in a graphic adventure in the 90s. The idea being that it should actually be fun to play and you shouldn't be punished too badly for getting something wrong. Uh, graphic adventures prior to that would be like, well, you would just die. 
if you couldn't solve the puzzle, it would usually kill you, and then you'd have to go back to an earlier save and just try bumbling through it again. But but the, the Monkey Island games were were revolutionary in that they were fun, they were funny, uh, they were amusing, they were complex. They had amazingly complex puzzles in them, and they it, it wouldn't smack you over the head for failing to get the puzzle right on the first occasion. Uh, and also, it wouldn't just stop your progress because a lot of these graphic adventures prior to that were very very linear you would like start at this point and then solve a puzzle to move on to the next part and then solve a puzzle to move on to the next part but in monkey island if you couldn't get one puzzle you just go to other parts of the island and, and see more of the story uh solve some puzzles there and then maybe come back maybe you couldn't solve that first puzzle until you'd been somewhere else on the island and gotten an object that you could only get from somewhere else in order to come back you know it was it was it was an actual proper game rather than an exercise in in masochism that the graphic adventures had been before that and pre pretty much i mean it did so incredibly well everybody started catching on and so other games like i'm going to trigger a bit of a nostalgia trip here for people of a certain age here games like legends of carandia uh, and stuff like that would start to come out and basically copy the the lucasfilm games template uh, and it was a great time graphic adventures graphic adventures and flight sims used to be the two number one genres of games on the pc and now <laughs> it's the other way around. Nobody plays graphic adventures or flight sims anymore, except for DCS World and maybe War Thunder, but well, that's about it. <laughs> but yeah, Secret of Monkey Island. And of course, its sequel, uh, Return to Monkey Island, LeChuck's Revenge. Not so much the third one, but the first two were absolutely amazing. Next question comes from Basement NATO Jesus. Dear Jingles, as an older man yourself, it's rare for someone your age to even know half the things about video games you do or even care as much as you do. What got you into video games and what made it stick? Yeah, I've got a couple of neighbours who are about the same age as me and I, they have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Although they play a lot of board games. Um, and I'm gonna, I've, I've got the original, well not the original, Avalon Hill version of Dune, but I've got the Gale Force 9 reissue of the original 1970s I'll, which is a i don't know if you've ever seen anybody playing dune the board game uh, there's a youtube channel called mcdm which i think it's short for matt colville dungeon master it's this guy called matt colville and they they run games and they they did dune and i think it took three hour and a half or possibly four hour and a half long videos to cover an entire single gaming session of dune um, it is possibly the greatest board game ever made. It is ferociously complicated. Nobody understands really how they play it until you've had at least four or five gaming sessions on it. Uh, but I'm planning to play that one with the neighbours. But anyway, getting back to the question. Um, what made you get into video games? Okay, uh, again, going back to my first ship, HMS Brazen, in the first Gulf War. Um, you can't... Sp I mean, <laughs> you got paid reasonably well in the Navy and of course you're on a ship in the middle of nowhere during a war uh, there's not a lot of opportunity to go ashore and spend money so I came back from that first Gulf War with a lot of money saved up and got back in touch with all of my friends from high school one of them uh, went by the name of Gary Dutton and he just bought uh, an Amiga 500 I don't know if anybody remembers those computers and uh, this was the Street Fighter 2 had just come out. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> a real button masher of a game. Also games like Shadow of the Beast. And, but you have to bear in mind that prior to this, the only computer games I'd ever seen were on the ZX Spectrum or the BBC Micro. Games like, you know, Pac-Man. And then suddenly I'm looking at an Amiga 500 with a dedicated sound chip. You know, it's not just bleeps and boops. It's actual music. Um, and Shadow of the Beast... I'd never seen parallax scrolling before. <laughs> so, and then of course Street Fighter 2 was just incredible. Um, and I thought, right, that's it. I know what I'm spending my money on. And I went out and I bought myself a Commodore Amiga. Uh, and I was an Amiga player for years. And the thing that made me actually buy a PC uh, was, I think it was on my second ship, HMS Coventry, another Type 22 frigate, not to be confused with the HMS Coventry that was sunk in the Falklands. That was a Type 42 destroyer. Um, uh, oh, that was it. It was another Lucasfilm game, X Wing, the Star Wars space flight simulator. And it was originally supposed to come out on the Amiga and the PC. And then, about 
two or three months before it was due to come out, they said they'd cancel plans to develop it on the Amiga and it was going to be a PC exclusive. And so I bought a PC <laughs> because I was going to play that game. In fact, in fact, I had an another friend called uh, Jason Banks who was a computer game developer. And he had this laptop that he would take home from work in order to work at home. And it was, I mean, it wasn't state-of-the-art laptop by any stretch of imagination you know nobody was making gaming laptops in the 90s um and it was basically it was a black and white screen there was no mouse it had a touchpad and before i got my own pc i actually got x-wing i think it came on five 4.5 inch floppies i got x-wing before i had my own pc and I can remember being on leave at home over the summer when the game came out and I would go around to Jason's house and install X-Wing on this shitty little laptop and I actually, bear in mind, it's a, it's a, it's a space flight simulator, right? I mean, it's, it's not up there with Star Citizen, but it's the same, you know, it's in the same ballpark and I played the entire first tour of duty of X-Wing on this black and white screen laptop controlling it using a touchpad <laughs> and by the way if you fail the mission in this it sent you right back to the start of the not the start of the mission right back to the start of the campaign if you died you had to start again because games were brutal in the 90s uh, notwithstanding what i said about the secret of monkey island so that was that was why i got my first pc but it was it was um games like shadow of the beast and Street Fighter 2 on the Commodore Amiga that got me into computing in the first place, and it was Star Wars X-Wing uh, that got me to switch over to PC. Next question from Matty83. Yes, I am recording. Second question, if you could save any warship as a museum ship from those which went to the scrappers, aside from the obvious duo of War Spy and Enterprise, which ones would you choose? Oof, three examples, you put me on the spot there. I might have to stop and have a, a think about that. Um, Third question, any chance you can visit Prague in the future? Your last visit got foiled, yeah. And that time I got Wargaming to agree to meet with the others. Sadly, you were missing, yeah. So I can't remember exactly what the occasion was, but I was supposed to go to um, Wargaming Prague to do something World of Warships related. And I can't remember the exact details, but it, it basically involved me being crap and missing my flight oh it was something to do with we were at we actually got to the airport and then we looked at our boarding passes and we got confused about the the time the boarding gate opened and the time that the boarding gate closed and so we we arrived like 30 seconds after the boarding gate closed the aircraft didn't take off for another 20 minutes but they wouldn't let us on you know it's right there we, here are our tickets we're 30 seconds late it's it's not it's it's not even starting taxiing yet, but no, they wouldn't let us on. So we ended up never going to Prague. I'd love to go to Prague, um, especially around Christmas. It's a massive holiday destination around Christmas. They 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 rack up. I mean, it's. I'm trying to think. Where is it? In the, no, no. I'm sorry. I was getting a bit confused. Prague, obviously, Czech Republic. Um, but uh, I think it's Dubrovnik in Croatia that I was. Because I was thinking Prague, it's got all of these, you know, tourist, touristy things in the summer, all the Game of Thrones fans. But no, that's Dubrovnik in Croatia, isn't it? I was getting mixed up. Uh, but definitely around Christmas, Prague is, is, is the holiday destination in Europe. I'd love to go. The beer there, of course, is amazing. They've got proper Budweiser, you know, not the cheap rubbish that the Americans make. <laughs> Actual proper Budweiser. Um, there are, I mean, there are a couple of places in Europe that are great for beer. Um, Germany is the obvious one that everybody knows about, but the slightly less well-known ones are Belgium and the Czech Republic, where the beer is absolutely fantastic. So yes, I would, I would love to go to Prague. Maybe, I don't know, maybe next Christmas. Maybe next Christmas when I take my two weeks off, I'll actually haul my ass over there and see how the other half live. As for your second question, if I could save any warship as a museum ship, I might have to have a think about that one um, and post that in the comments uh, for when this goes up as an episode of Mingles with Jingles on Monday. Because I, I mean, you, the obvious one obviously was, was War Spite, because although War Spite, War Spite, I don't think ever ended up actually going to the scrapyard, did it? Because it, it slipped its, its lines when it was being towed to be scrapped. It refused to go to the scrapyard and went down fighting. Uh, ran itself aground and had to be uh, 
and that would be bombed by the Royal Air Force and of course the Air Force screwed that up <laughs> because they're the Air Force. Uh, um, my obvious choice there would have been the War Spy. I would have loved to have seen that one saved. But um, if, I mean if they could have saved, I was going to say any one of every, of every class of ship that served. But who's going to pay for it? That's, that's of course the big question because these things are expensive. Um, and the government, they, they don't like paying for them. So they often have to be sold on to private charities. But yeah, I'll have to have a think about that. Because um, you really put me on the spot with this one. And you wouldn't let me pick the war spot. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll have a think about that. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one as a comment in tomorrow. Or if you're watching this as Mingles with Jingles. Today's episode of Mingles with Jingles. Oh, uh, and he's just reminded me. It was Kings of the Sea. Yeah, I was supposed to be presenting Kings of the Sea, wasn't I? Yeah. And I screwed that one up by uh, missing my flight to Prague. Anyway, next question from Moby. Dear Supreme Salt Mines Overlord, I humbly come to you to ask if you've given some thought to put a supercut or highlight of all of your Mingles with Jingles episodes where your friend Eddie made an appearance. Oh, Eddie. I'm sure there are many others that would love to be able to look back and listen as you and Eddie tell stories and shoot the breeze while sampling the preferred beverage of the day. Yeah, that would probably be a 40 hour long video. <laughs> Because <laughs> basically any episode of Mingles with Jingles where Eddie was there, it was just the two of us sitting on a couch, just shooting the shit, uh, telling terrible stories about each other <laughs> and trying to embarrass each other uh, and sampling whatever beer. Oh, and showing off the t-shirt of the day as well. Honestly, you could just go back and watch any episode of Mingles with Jingles with Eddie in it. They're easy enough to spot because the thumbnail isn't the regular Mingles with Jingles thumbnail. It's just me and Eddie. I do miss him, you know. Uh, oh well, what are you going to do? You're not going to make me cry, Moby. <laughs> I'm not going to cry for you. Next question from Volker802. New Year to we all. A more personal question. Is it true what they say about the Navy? Do you guys get into intimate situations at sea and were you dragged into that? Uh, yes and no. I should probably elaborate on that one. I never knew of anybody, any two guys getting it on in 22 years. But right after, we, all of today's questions seem to be going back to the first Gulf War. Right after we got back from the first Gulf War in March 91, um, the ship went on summer leave. And when we came back, we got the first wrens female sailors on board and um, yes people suddenly started getting into a lot of intimate situations at sea uh, not supposed to it's a disciplinary offense um, but it happened <laughs> actually i can remember uh, <laughs> one situation i might have talked about this in mingles with jingles before um, i can't remember the guy's name let's just call him dave why not uh, and I also can't remember the girl's name, so let's just call her Davina. Why not? Um, and they were an item, and everybody knew it, but everybody pretended that they didn't know it. Oh, yeah, actually, I do remember her name. Let's just, just, let's just call her Leone anyway. She was part of the ship's flight. Um, I can't remember her exact job. She was like a meteorological... whatever. Anyway, she was absolutely gorgeous. And this leading seaman, who was her boyfriend... Um, lucky bastard <laughs> anyway um i can't remember where we were it's not important but we were docked somewhere for a couple of days uh and you get l you get night leave uh when you're docked in a foreign port uh, you basically have to be back on board um before start of work the next day um it, it, you, you get a different um curfew time depending on what rank you are so like junior rates have to be back on board by a certain time senior rates by a certain time officers technically can't be late um an officer's leave expires whenever he arrives back on board the ship but if they didn't want the exo to make their life a living hell the officers were back on board at a respectable time as well so you get the general idea anyway dave and davina were out uh went to a hotel for the night and they were late back on board in the morning so uh, this is known as being adrift, and it's a serious offence in the Navy. I mean, 
you know, being turning up late for work is a serious offence in the army. I'm pretty sure it's not in the air force, because you know they're the air force. But it's a really, really serious offence in the navy because if you're late, you can miss the ship. Right? It's not like if you're on an army base, the base isn't going anywhere, but a ship does. It's one of the things that makes a ship different from a base. So the navy take a very, very dim view of people turning up late for anything. Right? It can be. It can. You can get into serious shit over it. So Dave and Davina had themselves an interesting evening ashore in whatever hotel they went to and then they were late back on board in the morning and knowing how deeply in the shit they could be, they made up a story. They got mugged, they got kidnapped. <laughs> really. um, and, uh, and that's why they were three hours late getting back on board the next morning. I mean, the ship wasn't going anywhere, you know, it was still docked in this place, but it, it, could, have, it could have been, which is why the Navy takes it so seriously. So, um, I mean, they got charged and they were tried separately. So I, I, as when I joined the Navy, I was a radio operator, but then after five years, a branch changed to writer. And as a writer, I would be present at the executive officer's table when he was trying the guilty, uh, presenting the paperwork and so on and so on. So I was there, I had a front row seat for it. It was hilarious. So the XO went by the name of Dave Prentice. Oh, the stories I could tell you about Dave Prentice. Lieutenant Commander Prentice. I first met him when he was sub-Lieutenant Prentice, although prior to that, he was on HMS Brazen during the first Gulf War. All these stories keep going back to this. Prior to being on board HMS Brazen, he was uh, Chief Electronic Warfare uh, Rating Prentice. So he joined as a boy sailor and then worked his way up, got selected for officer and eventually Lieutenant, um, he was the executive officer on board HMS Newcastle, and I think I'm pretty sure he got promoted to commander and had command of his own ship before he uh, finally retired from the Navy. But this was when he was the executive officer responsible for discipline on board HMS Newcastle. So Dave's standing there in front of him, spinning this cock and bull story about how they'd been kidnapped <laughs> and taken to this warehouse somewhere, and, and these criminals try to get there their uh, cash point card numbers off them and all sorts of bullshit. And the EXO clearly, clearly wasn't believing a word of it. <laughs> right. Now, the thing you have to understand that as a leading rate, um, there are certain punishments that can't be given to you. So as, 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 a, as a regular sailor, you can have what they call number nine punishment, which is stoppage of leave, right? You're confined to the ship, you're not allowed to go ashore, and they work your ass off. Um, you're up two hours before everybody else, working, doing shitty jobs. You go to bed two hours after everybody else, working, doing shitty jobs. You have to, there's all kinds of, it's a pretty nasty punishment. But you can't give number nine punishment to a leading rate. Um, the, 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 the worst thing, I mean, the worst thing that the executive officer, obviously you go in front of the captain, the captain's table, he can give you bigger punishments. Uh, and can even recommend that you get sent off for court martial. But if, if when you go to the XO's table, for if it's a serious offence, usually the XO will say, right, I'm going to defer this and pass it on to the captain. That's when you know you're in the shit. Um, but the XO can give you a punishment if he thinks he's going to handle it himself. So Dave's standing up in front of the XO, spinning this massive cock and bull story about how he'd been kidnapped. The XO's nobody believed a word he was saying, and he's sweating bullets down in there in his number one uniform at attention in front of the XO. And he gets to the end of this bullshit story. <laughs> And the XO just looks at him straight in the eye and says, was she worth it? And he says, yes, sir. He says, right, admonished, fuck off. Admonished is a punishment that the XO can give. And it basically just means you've been a bad boy. Don't do it again. Get out of my sight. No actual punishment. It is an actual punishment. It's recorded on your discipline sheet as a punishment, but nothing happens. The regulating petty officer nearly choked. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he thought this guy was going to detention quarters. <laughs> he thought he thought there was going to be a court martial. He nearly choked <laughs> at the idea. Like his face was a picture. Um, Dave, of course, was like, "Oh, cheers, sir. Thanks very much." Off he goes. But uh, I've completely forgotten what the question was, by the way. <laughs> uh, to you about the navy. Oh, in the situations. Yeah. So this was the story of what happened when. Uh, I mean, I do remember their actual names now, but we'll just call them Dave and Davina. Oh, and she also just got a slap on the wrist and sent away as well, uh, because that's just what this this XO was like. He was such a good man. I would have gone anywhere and fought anybody with him as the XO, and later on as the captain when he was promoted commander and he got his own ship. Uh, did I ever tell you the story about how during? I can't remember what it was we were doing, um, but 
as the XO, as well as being in charge of discipline, he's also in charge of all seamanship evolutions. So when, when you know, things to do with sailing the ship, including replenishments at sea, when you sail alongside a tanker and you pass lines over and then you bring hoses over from the tanker and then you refuel. So we were refueling from an American tanker. And that's the kind of guy this, this was the XO, remember, in charge of discipline. Um, as the XO, he is the man in charge of things like replenishing at sea. And again, as a, as a writer, I was what they called the, oh yeah, I was Batman. <laughs> These things called Razbats, and they're basically just red and green colored panels. And then you, you signal, because there's no, I mean, you've got radio communications from the bridge to the bridge of the tanker, but that's no good to the guys out in the dump area where the hoses are coming in. So you do visual signaling with these paddles, um, you know, ready to start pumping, tension the lines, and all kinds of different signals for it. And that was, that was my job during a RAS. And it was great because, you know, it got me out in the fresh air and out the ship's office. And uh, I'm standing right up there with the XO and the supply officer and the, you know, the chief bosun's mate. So right at the heart of things, grandstand view of everything, fun. But the XO hadn't turned up, so like, where the hell's the XO? He's late. It's not like the XO. And then he turned up, dressed as Osama Bin Laden, for this refueling operation with an American tanker. That's just the kind of sense of humour this guy had. Uh, the pranks that he used to get up to when he was a sub-lieutenant were the stuff of legend. But anyway, uh, I've devoted enough time to this question. Uh, let's get some more answered before we run out of time. Dave Prentice, man, that guy was an absolute legend. Eddie knew him as well, of course, and he, he worshipped him as well. Next question comes from Snazzy. Jingles, will you be watching the upcoming series, Monsters of the Air? It's the third series in the excellent trio that's Band of Brothers in the Pacific and it's about the mighty 8th Air Force and the B-17s. Yeah, definitely. Uh, obviously, I mean, everybody loved Band of Brothers, but I was a big fan of the Pacific as well, even though it didn't do quite as well. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why the Pacific didn't do quite as well was because Band of Brothers had done so well. Tom Hanks, his production company, turned around at Netflix and said, was it Netflix? No, HBO, and said, right, more money this time. And um, and that didn't leave, put it this way, it wasn't as profitable due to the amount of money that the production company charged HBO for the rights to make it. But uh, yeah, uh, Masters of the Air, very much looking forward to it. Um, because even though the Pacific wasn't as successful, I still thought it was really, really good. Uh, not as good as Bad Brothers, but still really, really good. So I'm very much looking forward to Masters of the Air. I wonder if it's based... I'm sure somebody's going to let me know because obviously um, Band of Brothers was based on the Stephen Ambrose book Band of Brothers. Uh, the Pacific was based on two books uh, with the old breed and uh, I can't remember the name of the other one um, but not written by Stephen Ambrose but Stephen Ambrose did write a book about B-17 bomber crews. It was called The Wild Blue Yonder I think and I, I'm just wondering if this is based on that, or whether or not it's based on another word. I'm sure somebody's going to let me know at some point. Um, also, he says, will you be going to Tank Fest to hear the ship bombs been brought back to life? Yes, they, they want to restore the FE4005, don't they? Uh, which has been sitting as a gate guard outside the back gate of the Tank Museum for the last 10 years. Um, I don't know if they're going to have it ready in time for Tank Fest. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, you never know. But I, I don't actually have any plans to go to Tank Fest. Um, I used to really enjoy going, and it is a great show, and it's definitely worth it if you haven't been before, and it's probably still worth it even if you have been before, because they always have different vehicles uh, in the arena. And the Tank Museum is just amazing, but it's, it's kind of different for me, because I can't go to Tank Fest and just watch stuff, because of... I know this is going to sound really like I'm a massive egomaniac, but it, I just can't because of who I am. Um, so I don't really get the opportunity to see stuff. Instead, it's just they stick me in a room somewhere and the queue forms and I'm there for the whole day shaking hands and saying hello, which is fine. I mean, I don't object to doing that, obviously. But, you know, you go to Tank Fest, you want to see the tanks. You don't want to be sitting in a room saying hello to 500 people. Um, plus, trust me when I say this, when you shake hands with 500 people, your hand starts to hurt after the first few hundred and <laughs> becomes really, really painful. So uh, I, I tend to sneak to the Tank Museum at random times of the year when there's nothing really going on. Although I don't think I've been there since the Southwest Model Show, which is really good, by the way. If you ever, because, I mean, you know, obviously it's a Tank Museum, there's lots of tanks, there's Tank Fest, there's Tiger Day, but they, they do other stuff there as well. Like they do a day every year where they've got a whole bunch of Daleks that come out. <laughs> 
Uh, so they do a Doctor Who day, and then the Southwest Model Show they host there every year, and it's it's fantastic. The oh, there's just some amazing stuff. But I think that was the last time I actually went to the Tech Museum. Anyway, yes, moving on. Um, look, now 43 minutes in, I'm going to have to start putting an end to this. Let's have a look at this question here from Yang Weebly. Great Overlord jingles. Tomorrow is the birthday of one of my best ever friends. Oh, of, sorry, <coughs> one of my best friends ever, Andrea. Can we get a shout out for her? Absolutely. Actually, since uh, I'm fairly confident that Andrea isn't here live on Sunday while we're recording it, which means that the, op the, sh the only opportunity she's going to get to watch this will be on her actual birthday on Monday in Miggles the Jingle. So, Andrea, Yang Wee Lee would love to wish you. A happy birthday and, and I would too so uh, many happy returns I hope you're having a fantastic day get out and do something interesting instead of sitting in here watching YouTube videos <laughs> okay <laughs> happy birthday Andrea secondly big shout out to the amazing moderators that make everything possible while I just sip coffee and act like a celebrity <laughs> yeah yeah we really really do have a great admin team here on the discord server. there's a lot of work that goes up behind the scenes that you probably aren't aware of uh, but which needs to be done in order to ensure, well, things like this happen as smoothly as they do. Uh, thirdly, Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's not fair. Um, it's Worcester sauce, obviously. It's just spelt Worcestershire because English, stop. <laughs> right. Honestly, I think English does, does the, does, just does things like this to trap foreigners um, and make the rest of us laugh. Um, and I know it's not fair, but that's just the English language. There are no rules. Uh, P.S. Happy New Year, and I hope you re have a wonderful Christmas. Thank you, we did. P.P.S. Because you know our religion already. What anime are you planning on watching in 2024? Oh, God. Um, I don't know. I've already done Cyberpunk Edge Runners. I have no plans to watch any other anime. Um, and no, no, I, I'm not looking for any recommendations before all you filthy weebs start. Because I know what you like. You don't need any encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> and I think on that note, uh, thank you to everybody for the questions. Thanks again. Well, not again. I think this is probably the first time I've done it. But thank you for the reminder from Yang Weebly uh, to thank all of the moderators for taking care of this event and make sure that it happens um, smoothly. And thank you to everybody who turned up. And if you're watching this as an episode of Mingles with Jingles, hope you all had a great weekend. And as always, take care. And I'll catch you next time.